the very first lecture talked about what an agent was. And remember that you're an agent, and you have a unique perspective on your thinking and your action. And so we're going to ask you throughout this class to start thinking about thinking in a deeper way than you might be used to. Imagine your AI class as a lab in critical thinking. Very early on in computing, uh, computation became a metaphor for human thought. And you would see psychology texts that talked about an information processing perspective on thought. As a computer scientist, I'm guessing you've already thought deeply about thought and about communication. We'll talk about a little zen of computing. To some extent, our business's programming is about communicating with the world's stupidest entity that's capable of response. And so you think about communication quite deeply, even if you're not conscious about it. When we debug a program, it's not until the very end of a, what is often a long, deep process that we get the final result. And so we become aware that our thinking is often flawed or incomplete. It's something which is quite nice about our training as computer scientists. We think and reflect on thinking. Uh, AI is going to give you some additional concepts uh, in which to contemplate thought. You're going to be thinking about how to represent knowledge. You're going to be thinking about how to get a computer to do exploration, to make choices, to evaluate choices. This is going to be a new vocabulary that you are able to use in reflecting on your own thinking. And this includes reflecting on very mundane examples of thought. So here's a very simple example of uh, the kind of mundane thinking that I mean. I'll just recount this story very briefly. I ran into a colleague in a supermarket when I was working in Washington, D.C. at the National Science Foundation. And we talked about renewing for a third year. We'd each come at the same time. I asked her where she was located in SF. She said, I was in biology, the Division of Ecological Sciences. And I told her I'd send her a link on a related conference that involved computing and sustainability. And she seemed excited about the conference and its implications for biodiversity. And so we parted ways, and I was going to send her a link the next day. The next day, I'd completely forgotten to email my colleague. But I was on my way back from lunch, and I was taking the elevator up, and it opened. And I saw this text blocked in large part by the elevator door. EI followed by a long space. M and what looked like an O or an A, and then B and what appeared to be an I. This represented the barest part of a sign that indicated what floor I was on. And I reminded instantly to email my colleague. And the question is, why might this have triggered a reminding? Pause the video when you're ready and reflect on what caused this reminding. What were the relevant environmental cues and what knowledge did it trigger? And you might start by thinking about what the sign in its totality. Go ahead and pause the video now and start it up when you're ready. If you thought the sign said Division of Molecular Biology, you would be right. At the time, I was in the NSF building, which I didn't tell you explicitly in the story, but that's some of the insight that you might have had without even realizing it. Probably would have primed me to think about my NSF colleague. I probably did some pattern matching without even realizing it. I also knew that there was a molecular biology division, and I knew to be part of the same directorate as the ecological sciences division. I don't mean to imply there's anything remarkable about the story, but there's some interesting things going on, even though it's a very mundane story. There's information that I'm using that I'm not even aware of, pattern matching those words against words I know information about the structure of NSF and the divisions under directorates of NSF, the relationships between those divisions. All of this is information that I was not just of using, but if you were to think about how to build a computer to do the same kind of thing, you'd have to think about all that information that I employed to cause that reminding. And that's what's so interesting, even about mundane problems like this, when you talk about mechanizing them as an AI system. July 2011, my wife and I took a driving tour of the Midwest, and I took a whole lot of pictures. I placed a lot of these pictures on Google, Picasso in particular. And a very cool functionality of that is I could place these pictures uh, in the locations on Google Maps. In many cases, what I would do is I would use information to place these pictures. I would use cues like highway junctions, uh, names, schools, and cemeteries, even mountain peaks in the case of some places in South Dakota. And the order in which the pictures were taken, which was given as a sequence in a file, 
provided some useful information because once I had placed a single picture, I constrained where the next picture had to be placed. And all of these sources of knowledge would have been important if I were to be interested in building an AI system to do the same thing. In the case of one picture, though, taken in Scribner, Nebraska, even though I knew where some previous pictures were taken, um, and it constrained the region where this must have been placed, it was very hard for me to identify where this picture was taken. You can take a look and you can see what might be relevant cues. It has a steeple. So here you see the building on the right. And I'm guessing you can make out the same features and a Google map on the left. And this is actually a much smaller uh, snippet of a Google map than I had to work with. But see if you can identify where you think this building actually is located in this uh, satellite view. Think about the kinds of information you used to identify where it was. Go ahead and pause now and reflect on that. Restart when you're ready. If you said the building was in the lower left-hand corner by where the Google map says Fulton Street, you'd be right. You'd probably use that dot in the middle of that building to identify the steeple. But you also might have used information about the grass behind the building, which is sort of veering up to the top in the satellite view. And if you take a look at the picture, it veers off to the right in the um, uh, street view. Now, again, this is a very mundane example. It's not intended to indicate deep, deliberative thought. But think about what you had to do in order to make this placement. You had to translate from the street view to a satellite view. And this is non-trivial. This would be very hard for a computer to do it. And you'd have to think, what kinds of information would it need? How would I represent that information? you'd probably find that uh, you're talking about much more sophisticated representation schemes than you're used to in computer science classes. Now I had a little bit more information to work with than you did. You can see where I've got the red arrow pointed. On the satellite view at that time there was actually a shadow and you could see the steeple. Even so it's very hard for me to see until I looked at a satellite image, primarily because I had been looking at the earth image beforehand. But again, even knowing that a steeple creates a shadow. Think about how you'd represent that for a computer. One of the interesting things about artificial intelligence, you're going to have to think and reflect on how you might represent that knowledge for a computer in order to get a computer to behave intelligently. I want you to think too about goals and other people's actions to some extent. Um, this recounts a story of going to a DVD rental store. But in this DVD store, and many, the videos would be slightly out of alphabetical order. That is, you'd be going in and looking for a movie, and you'd have to do some search. And at first I thought the people in this store were lazy or they couldn't alphabetize or whatever. But after a while I came to appreciate what it is they were doing. What were their goals? What were they hoping? What kind of behavior were they hoping to elicit in me and other customers? If you think they were trying to elicit search and spontaneous purchasing or renting, You'd be right, I think. That's exactly what they were trying to do. By placing the videos slower, they were causing me to search and see titles that I would overlook had I, uh, they'd been in alphabetical order. This would probably not be a strategy that would be effective in a library. It wouldn't be effective in something like Netflix or an online catalog. But then again, Netflix has other ways, recommender systems, of uh, causing me to look at titles that I would not otherwise look at. So remember this Pool Macworth slide. Uh, about agents. And just remember that you're an agent. As you think about your thinking and your actions, think about what kind of information or knowledge you might have that's relevant. What kinds of observations in the environment are relevant to the kinds of that you're trying to accomplish? What processing are you going through to come to conclusions and to take actions? These are all relevant. And when you reflect on these, reflect on how you would represent uh, or encode this information and these processes for a computer. Finally, I uh, will often direct you to TED videos, just like I direct you to Radio Lab podcasts. Um, what it really calls irrational, I would probably call bounded rationality. But listen to this video, a quite entertaining uh, view of people's bounded rationality. I want you to imagine how we can build computers that move beyond bounded.